Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another exciting webinar brought to you from George Washington University, all the way from Washington, D.C. in the U.S. I see quite a few of you who have started joining in. Welcome once again to an exciting masterclass. So uh, while we're waiting for the others to join in, if the 70 plus of you who are in this room could very quickly let us know in the chat window which city or which country you're dialing it from. We want to know where all of you exciting, excited students are coming in from today. So very quickly in the chat window, if you could let us know which city or which country you are dialing in from. So we have Dipangi from Delhi, Arpan from Kolkata. Hey guys, thank you for joining. We have Atheria from Kochi, a uh, couple of more people from Delhi, someone from Surat, Jodhpur. Anyone who's from outside of India also, let us know which country you're dialing in from. We really like to know where the students are coming in from today. So we have Kepal mm -hmm. from Hong Kong, Kimberly from Nigeria, a uh, lot of people, Arzu from the US. Hey, Arzu. Uh, people from Chennai, Varanasi. So I can safely say from the length and breadth of the country and from other places as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Someone from right across the border in Pakistan, our neighbors. Hello, Aisha. Welcome to the masterclass and a few more. We, I can see we're close to 150 plus of you in the room. So very quickly, we have, like I mentioned, a very, very exciting masterclass today brought to you by the George Washington University School of Business all the way from, yes, you guessed it right, Washington, D.C. And a very interesting topic for today, which is data analytics in the accounting profession. So uh, very exciting masterclass in which we are going to dive into the exciting world when numbers meet technology, discover why data analytics is taking the accounting industry by a storm and the changes that is in store for this industry. So I will not be going into a lot of details about this because we have the experts with us. And with that, I would now like to quickly introduce you to our esteemed panel for today. So quick introductions. My name is Sabahat Hurzuk. Uh, I am a student success manager with Seed Global Education. We are a UK headquartered company which facilitates interaction between top global universities like the one we have with us today and prospective students like yourself, giving you a chase, giving you a chance to connect with the faculty, understand the kind of programs and offerings that the university is doing and thereby helping you making these informed choices. Joining us today from the George Washington University, I have Dr. Donald Bazinkai, who is Hello, doctor, who is a teaching assistant professor of accountancy at GWSP. Uh, he has been an accounting instructor since 2016. He is a CPA and his research interests include reviewing reviews of accounting standards, reputation repair actions that firm pursue in the aftermath of unfavorable company events and auditing case studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bazinkai, for joining us today. Along with him, we also have Megan Fanson who is the Associate Director in the Graduate Admission Office of the GWSP. Thank you so much, Megan, also for joining us. Megan is your go-to person if you are looking to get <laughs> admissions into GWSP. She's going to be talking a lot more in detail about the programs and offerings. So without further ado, I can see we are close to 260 plus of you in the room. Before I sort of hand over the state, so to speak, to Dr. Bazinka. I'm going to run my first poll question for today. So to all of you in the audience, if you could have a look on the screen in front of you is our first poll question for this evening. How important do you think data analytics is for the future of accounting? Are you someone who feels it's very important because it's constantly changing how we work and will keep doing so? Are you someone who feels it is somewhat important, it might be useful, but its impact may be exaggerated? Or are you someone who feels it's not important, traditional methods are enough, we really don't need data analytics. So to all 280 of you uh, in the audience currently, I can see all of you. Very quickly, the first poll question is on the screen in front of you. If you could quickly go and cast your votes and let us know how important do you think data analytics is for the future of accounting. I'm going to keep the poll running for a little bit more and end it. So very quickly, uh, to, we're close to 300 people in the room right now. If you could go and quickly cast your votes and let us know what do you think. With that, I'm going to end the poll question and announce the results. So here are the results in front of you. 
85% uh, of you feel it's very important. 15% of you think it might be useful, but slightly exaggerated. And none of you think that it's not important. So everyone in the room present here is acknowledging the importance of data analytics. Great. With that, I now hand over to Dr. Bazankai uh, to take us through his presentation and give us a lot more details about this. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Salaha, and good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. I see that we have people from many different areas, and I just want to thank you. I know for many of you, it's pretty late in the evening, and thank you for taking the time uh, for us to talk about data analytics for a half an hour or so. Um, I agree with kind of your perspectives that you guys thought in the poll. Uh, I feel that data analytics is going to continue to change the way we do accounting. But we also have to make sure that we understand the core accounting uh, theory and foundation. So I kind of see both perspectives and I was very happy to see that nobody thought it wasn't going to be important for the future. So we'll talk a little bit about data analytics in the accounting profession and just we'll go through three topics. A little bit of context as to why data analytics has become so significant. And I think there are three major items that contribute to that context. Then we wanna talk a little bit about how data analytics can be applied. And then we'll touch base on data analytics as a process. Um, when I teach data analytics for accounting, we walk through how it is as a process, and then we use that process to solve accounting problems using data analytics. So let's talk about the first um, item first. And by the way, uh, here are some of the sources that I used and use in my classroom um, for uh, these talks, these topics. Okay, so three items that I believe are driving uh, data analytics. One, there's been an absolute exponential growth in data. I'm sure that's not a surprise to everyone on the on the um, meeting here. And you can see that the amount of data that we have now, this is even 2020, has grown so fast. In fact, there's more data generated in the last couple of years than all of the data in the history of time before those two years. And we continue to expect to see data continuing to grow. Now you can see, if you look at the blue, that both structured data is growing and unstructured data, and unstructured data is data that maybe couldn't fit into a table form. So we see a lot of that in social media, et cetera. And so that's growing even at an even faster rate, right? So one is the exponential growth of data. The second thing is it's become very inexpensive to store data. If we look back at 1980, it literally cost $700,000 to store one gigabyte of data. That's amazing, huh? Because we all have flash drives that hold like 32 gigabytes of data and, they call, and they're cheap, right? And if we look by 2009, that came down from 700,000 US dollars to seven cents. But then if we go further, we could see that if we look at the blue, that it even went further from 2010. So, so data storage has become very inexpensive. And as we talked about also, global data availability is growing. So we have more data and it's not expensive to store it. The third thing is we now have a plethora of data analytics tools to help us analyze this data. And what used to require maybe computer science programming is now become as easy as just click and drag. And there are so many different tools that uh, companies can, uh, companies or students or professionals or anybody can use to analyze their data that it's become uh, very easy to do. So to kind of just kind of give some context, what we have 
is we have an exponential um, data growth. We have inexpensive data storage, and we also have user-friendly analysis tools. And, to, and in my opinion, if we take these three concepts together, this provides a data analytics opportunity, not just in accounting, but in virtually every profession, right? So what's happening now, companies and firms are trying to capitalize on this opportunity. Whether you're in marketing, whether you're in science, whether you're in um, journalism, wherever, you're trying to say, how can I take data and do a better job to um, become more fact-based in my analysis? Now, at one point, that opportunity is incredibly exciting, right? But there are challenges. Some of the challenges are, the data you may the, the data you want may not be available or it may be difficult to obtain and if it is available it may not be available for all the periods that you want to analyze or there were problems with the data during some periods and it was good other periods so it's it's a challenge and data sets in the real world are often messy, and we call that dirty data. And what does that mean? That means we need to scrub it. So in other words, when we obtain data, we have to analyze it for its quality. And normally, data is not ready to analyze immediately. So we want to go through a formal process to clean it up. And there's also privacy and security issues. Um, we have what's called PII, and that's personally identifying information. And this is going to vary by country in terms of legal issues surrounding this. But we have to be respectful of people's privacy, right? And we also have to be defensive about security breaches. So while it's very exciting that we have this data analytics opportunity, there's a challenge in the data, and we have to be very cautious in terms of how we use the data. So data analytics is, um, is a process. It's a science. And what we want to do is we want to take raw data. We want to remove excess noise. And we want to organize that data with the purpose of answering a question so that we can draw conclusions for decision-making. And from my perspective, data analytics is both an art and a science. It's a science in the sense that, one, there's a formal methodology to follow when you're doing data analytics. Secondly, there are numerous different statistical applications that one can use to correctly answer a question. But it's also an art because good data analytics requires good critical thinking, creativity, judgment, and resourcefulness. For example, you might have a question or your organization may have a question that it really wants to answer. And together, you could think of what data you could gather to get, answer that question. But maybe that data isn't available. So then what happens is a good data analyst will think of, well, what other alternative sources of data are there? What other methods could we employ if we don't have perfect data? So especially as data analytics is continuing to be more evolutionary, you, you almost need a can't quit attitude to say, hey, I want to follow a scientific process, but I also have to be creative in terms of what am I trying to solve and how I can solve it. I'm hoping that as we progress through time, data analytics will become more of a science and less of an art but there will always be a need for creativity and judgment and resourcefulness. 
Now here at the George Washington School of Business, we have a Department of Decision Sciences. I work in the accounting department. The Department of Decision Sciences is another department in our college. And there they have numerous classes regarding data analytics, artificial intelligence, et cetera. But data analytics has become more than just what one department can serve. For example, in the marketing department, data analytics is very good to help identify insights to how we can better serve our customer. For me in the accounting department, data analytics provides us with opportunities to build better information, better data to support our accounting records, okay? In accounting, there are a lot of judgment items. And if we can put better data to support our judgmental items, we're improving the quality of our accounting. Also, accounting is an information service um, uh, business, if you will. So as accountants, we're in the business of providing information to decision makers. So whether that's a tax decision, a managerial accounting decision, an auditing decision, et cetera, if we can put better data through a formalized process, we can add to the quality of the information we provide. So that's what I focus on, my background is not data analytics. My expertise is in accounting and finance. However, I've learned data analytics so that I can share with my students how we as accountants can use data analytics to become better accountants, okay? And no offense to people that are maybe more technical, it's very difficult for someone who studies decision sciences to become an accounting data analytics person because you have to have that accounting foundation, okay? So that's why here at George Washington University, we talk about data analytics both as a subject on its own, but also as a process that's implemented or integrated into other um, disciplines. Uh, so as I was saying, accounting is a service-oriented profession. It focuses on providing relevant, reliable, and timely information for an array of stakeholders. And so if we can use data analytics, we can help them make better informed decisions, right? Um, so data analytics provides accountants with the opportunities to provide higher quality data to execute their mission. Um, in our accounting courses, we explore how data analytics can provide better information versus the traditional methods that have historically been used with where there hasn't been that as much data. Uh, applications are appropriate for companies, audit firms, financial analysts, the government. As an example, in our country, we have what's called the IRS the Internal Revenue Service. And the job of the Internal Revenue Service is to make sure that citizens pay their taxes and that they follow the law. Well, with data analytics, the IRS now has a whole bunch of data, not only the information that citizens provide on their tax return, but also data from social media, data from other websites. And now the IRS can be more efficient in its auditing practice by identifying where it looks as though a person may not be complying with the law. Such so as one example of how data analytics provides um, a method to be more efficient in doing the core mission. For audit firms, the ability to audit all of a company's data, say 1 billion records, is much better 
than auditing just a sample of the data. Okay, so there are many ways that um, data analytics can make uh, accounting, all accountants' jobs easier. So I, I highlighted that we're also look at data analytics as a process. And here I'm sharing a four-step process. There are numerous models on data analytics. Some have five steps. I've seen some that have six steps. I think this four-step model, though, kind of provides the big picture that I think is good for today. And the first step, it starts with ask the question. In other words, we have to identify what are we trying to solve before we want to go and solve it. And then we have to say, okay, what data will we need to answer that question? And once we obtain that data, how do we make sure that the data is ready for analysis? Step three says, okay, now that we've readied our data for analysis, let's perform the appropriate analysis. And then finally, we want to share the story. Whoops, sorry, I went back. We want to share the story with our shareholders, our stakeholders, whoever that may be. And many people may not even know that we were working on this analysis, so, we, so we're going to provide them the whole story. Okay, so let me just touch base on these quickly. So there's a quote that says, your data won't speak unless you ask it the right questions. And this is probably the most critical step in the data analytics process, because if we can lead, if we can identify the right question, we can identify um, maybe the best solution. So as much as it's, it may be fast sometimes what question we're trying to solve, we really want to use critical thinking to make sure that we're asking the correct question. And then you might say, well, what is quick uh, critical thinking? So here are several definitions of critical thinking. I'll just use the first one as an example. The process, the process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information to reach an answer or conclusion. That one's consistent with data analytics. You know, another one is disciplined thinking that is clear, rational, open-minded, and informed by evidence, right? So as we identify our questions, we want to make sure that we're doing a good job of being objective, that we're being open-minded, so that we can really solve the right question. Um, and some example questions that we may do as accountants are, which product is most profitable at stores in, in a state in America? Why are costs increasing in the West, but decreasing in the East? Does this transaction exhibit characteristics of fraud? What is the likelihood that our customer will not be able to pay their amount due to us, right? All of these questions can be answered more effectively through data analytics than through traditional methods. So after we've identified our question, we then need to master the data. So first of all, is the data accessible? Can we get the data needed to answer our question? If the answer is yes, is the, is the data reliable? Is the data accurate? Is it valid? Is it consistent over time? Is the data structured? Is it internal to our organization? Is it data we have to get from the outside? Are there privacy concerns? These are things that we think about as we start to gain, gather the data to answer our question. Now, after we answer those questions, we have to do a three-step process. We have to extract the data, transform the data, and then load the data, okay? And we often call that ETL. So extraction is obtaining or retrieving data from a source or a platform. Um, transforming the data, you might want to also call it scrubbing the data to make sure it's useful for our needs. And then loading the data 
is usually the fastest process. And it's just about getting our scrub data into the tool that we want to use to analyze. Now, this process, extracting, transforming, and loading, in our current environment here in 2024, this is where data analytics professionals estimate that they spend 50 to 90% of their time on one data analytics project. And it's often an iterative process. In other words, we obtain some data, we analyze it, we realize there's some issues, we do some data scrubbing, we continue to analyze it, we continue to scrub it, and um, finally, hopefully, we get to a point where we say, okay, our data is now ready for analysis. And then there are four types of analysis. So now we're in the third step where we've obtained our data and now we wanna perform the analysis. And there's four categories, descriptive analysis, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. And I wanna just kind of highlight those for you. So um, descriptive analyses perform the characterize, summarizes, organizes past performance. So these just address factual questions. Did we make a profit? What was the amount of an average sale, et cetera? Diagnostic um, questions or analytics try to find the answer to why or the cause of a phenomenon. Example, why did advertising expense increase, but sales fell? Why did overall tax increase, even though net income did not? Predictive analytics provide foresight by identifying patterns in historical data. And so in other words, what we'll do is we'll look at historic data to make a prediction about the future. So as an example, can we predict if the financial statements will be misstated? What is our expected sales and income next year? And then finally, prescriptive analytics guide us on what we should do. So in other words, should the company lease or buy its headquarters office? How can revenues be maximized if there is a global supply chain shortage? So here are the four categories that I just discussed. If we analyze them, descriptive and diagnostic have a past orientation, whereas predictive and prescriptive have a future orientation. So as we said before, descriptive analytics talk about what happened, diagnostic talk about why something happened, predictive talk about what will happen, and prescriptive talk about what should be done. Now, this chart implies there's a y-axis. And that y-axis is value. As we move from descriptive, diagnostic, and predictive, and prescriptive, we're moving up and we're gaining value in our analysis. The chart also implies an x-axis. And what might that be? That's the level of difficulty or perhaps the cost. Descriptive analytics tend to be very easy and tend to be fairly inexpensive to run. Prescriptive analytics at the end or the end of the spectrum that tell us what we should do tend to be more complicated and are maybe a little more costly to run. So here's just the summary. And then, um, so when we look at descriptive analytics, we're gonna look at the script summary statistics. We may do some filtering. When we look at diagnostic, we may be looking at profiling, clustering, similarity matching, co-occurrence grouping. And these are things that we go through in our classes. When we do predictive, we may be doing regression analysis, classification analysis, link prediction. And we do when we do prescriptive, we're doing more machine learning, artificial intelligence, and we're building decision support systems, okay? And then finally, we wanna share the story. We wanna communicate our, our findings. And hopefully we have an answer to our question, but if not, maybe we may have identified new questions to ask. Now there's different ways we can do it. We may 
have a report with or without data visualizations. And data visualizations are going to be tables and charts. And the report that we provide to our stakeholders who are in often includes a full recap of the AMPS model, which was answer the question, master the data, perform the analysis, and share the story. And the reason why we share the whole story is context. Reports are shared with many people who may or may not even know there was an analysis to being done. So to win those people over, we want to provide them. This report answers the following question. We use the following data. We use the following process to clean the data. We then use the, fo the following analytic tools. And the reason why we do that is that provides our audience with confidence that one, critical thinking was used to ask, ask the question. Two, a formal process was used to obtain the most relevant and reliable data and a process was used to clean the data. Three, different tools were analyzed and the most and 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 why one tool was chose chosen over another or maybe multiple tools were used and then so with that everybody understands how the final answer was derived and people become a lot more confident or may have suggestions on how it could even be improved further Uh, so data visualization is just about presenting information graphically, presenting relevant information to decision makers, and the idea is to provide, convert data into information, into knowledge to support a decision. Um, and there's different tools we can use for that. We use Excel, Tableau, Power BI, or many of the other tools that I shared at the beginning. And then we develop and present the visualization. And then it's important that the chart, whatever we choose, reinforces knowledge and uh, helps people get to the answer. Okay. So as a recap, I want to just help everybody see that um, data analytics is a process. It's about asking the right question. In my class, it's about asking the right accounting questions. And then we talk about what's the right data, what's the right way to perform the analysis, and then finally, what's the best way to share the story. And when we do, we're going to walk everybody through this process so that they, everybody collectively has a true understanding of how the final answer was derived. So thank you very much. Sorry if I took a couple minutes extra. I hope to see you here on campus. And if I don't, good luck on all your endeavors. So I want to turn it back now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasankai. That was very, very insightful. Uh, gave us a lot of depth and understanding about the topic. And I can see quite a few of you have already started asking questions. So before we sort of move ahead, I'm going to take up a few questions, uh, Doctor, if that's okay. And we will try to tackle those. So the first question is from Sahil who wants to know that the rise of automation in accounting, accounting tasks is a growing concern. How can data analytics be used to empower accountants rather than replace their expertise? And of course, do you see a, foresee a future where data analytics specialists work alongside with accounting, accountants? Um, excellent question. And we talk about this often here in our university. Uh, Data analytics, artificial intelligence is going to, uh, it's interesting. People are worried. They Initially, people feel it as a threat that it's going to replace the accounting profession. And in some clerical positions, it has, to be 100% honest. However, it's, it's actually created more jobs than jobs that have been eliminated because Accounting, if you think about accounting, it's in the information providing business. So data analytics is unlocking greater opportunities to provide the core mission of providing better information. I feel bad for people that maybe don't pursue an advanced degree 
and where they where maybe their parents were able to have a good job in a clerical role, those jobs are are not as uh, available anymore. However, the jobs that people with advanced degrees and understanding of data analytics have more opportunities than ever before. And I've been working for 35 years in industry and in education. This is the lowest unemployment, at least in the United States, ever in the accounting profession. Um, yes, we for you, if you are a student and you are thinking about pursuing accounting and you're, you want to embrace data analytics and, and an artificial intelligence, because literally it will be part of the core toolbox that you will use in the future. In fact, I'll say it this way, I'm, I'm a kind of long answer, but in some areas, managers of departments are assigned staff and robots, okay? Not physical robots, but literally artificial intelligence because companies are making investments in robotics, artificial intelligence. And managers are actually evaluated on how they use their human resources as well as their artificial intelligence resources. So that is amazing to me. So you might be a manager of a big company's like accounting process and your effectiveness as a manager is not only going to be in terms of how you utilize the human capital that report to you, but also the technological capital that the company's invested that you lead the processes for. So here we talk about this and we want to then help to educate students to see that for one, and two, think about how they want to balance the use of technology and humans. Sorry about the long answer, but that was a no, really no, good No, no, that question. was that was great. Because uh, so there was another question by someone which could sort of act as a follow-up to this, where Arham Khan wants to know that given that everything is now supposed to be working hand in hand, for a data analyst, is it necessary to then learn coding? Should he sort of he's planning to do data analytics? So he wants to know should he invest some time and effort into learning some kind of computer or coding languages that would help him in his uh, career trajectory going forward? Um, well, first I'm gonna say it's never a bad idea to gain more knowledge, right? So if you understand how to code, that's great. But I will say this, and this is why the data analytics class is taught by myself, an accounting professor, and not a technical. Because technology is changing so quickly, the tools that are available for people to use are going to increasingly in, have already built in the ability okay. for us to just type in what I call plain English, but whatever your language is, for you to type in your language on what you want, and then programs will convert your language into code, okay? okay? So as we move through time, what's gonna be important isn't necessarily the ability to code. Although if you understand mm -hmm. code, you can probably write better questions for the, for the program to do. Right. What's gonna be important is your ability to critically evaluate what's the right question. Okay, so that way the program, the artificial intelligence tool will build a program based on the quality of your answer. If you give it a good, excuse me, question. If you give it a good question, it's gonna give you a program for a good question. If you give it a mediocre question, it's gonna give you a good program for a mediocre question. So okay. the future is about understanding what's the right information or question to ask from a business perspective, whatever your business is, accounting, marketing, health sciences, whatever. Great, great. Thank you for the, there are, honestly, there are a lot of questions. I'm going to take the last two ones before I sort of hand over to Megan. So, uh, you know, keeping in mind that we've spoken so much about this, of course, for any student who's looking to study out there, career opportunities is a big question in their mind. So we have a question from someone who wants to know what career opportunities 
are available for CPAs with an expertise in data analytics? Um, well, if you are a CPA with an expertise in data analytics, you will have two paths compared to a CPA who is not an expert in data analytics. A CPA with an, who's an expert in data analytics will be able to choose one path where they work for, say, the large accounting firms, just using the, the like, say, EY and, you know, those type of firms, where they will be helped to develop the future of accounting methodologies, auditing methodologies, tax methodologies, et cetera, at their firm. Mm -hmm. Because they will understand, as a CPA, they understand what the accountant needs to do as a data analytics expert, they understand what tools and processes and methodologies could be developed to best execute that mission. If you do say, I don't know if I want to be a developer of the data analytics profession at my firm or my company, I just want to be a better accountant. Well, if you're a CPA who's also a data analyst, you're going to approach how you solve, whether it's an auditing question or a managerial accounting question or a technical accounting issue, you're going to solve the question with data. And in general, accounting is a fact-based process. We have subjectivity, but the more we can use facts to support our answer, the better. So a data analyst is going to probably over time develop higher quality output, which hopefully will provide a faster career growth. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to take my last question uh, with you before I hand over to Megan. This question is from Prasanna Balaji. Uh, Prasanna says, I am doing a master's in investment management. And her concern is, I'm concerned about the reliability of reports provided by such models if their sources are altered because the business does not exist in a vacuum. It's an excellent concern. It's an excellent concern and could have been added to the list of challenges that we talked about. Right. One of the concerns of a nice data analytics report is they come out beautiful right? It's a, you know, you get beautiful charts and, yeah. but if the underlying data is not accurate, or if the, the question wasn't posed correctly, we might have a, a visualization or a story. If we go back to the AMPS model, I just discussed yeah. that looks correct, but we, but may not be so. So that's why it's very important whenever, even if you're not doing data analytics, but you're the recipient of a data analytics process, it's worthwhile to ask, what is this chart trying to answer? How was the data developed and put into it? What data is being used? What analytical tool was used to come up with this chart? Because that way, that context helps to answer the question that the that the student is concerned about right that you know cuz garbage in garbage out a beautiful chart with bad data is not a chart we should look at so it's so it's good to have a question and it's good to have be skeptical at first great thank you so much dr basimka uh, i know there are a lot more questions we will take them up uh, at a later stage once we are sort of done with megan's presentation uh, I would now like to call Megan to take us through the various programs and offerings at GW. Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, we will be coming back to you shortly. In the meantime, I would now like to hand over to Megan. Megan, if you could quickly take us through uh, the programs and offerings at GW. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for joining everyone. It's really cool to see how many different places we have people from today. So I am just going to share my screen a second and we will get started. All right, so before we go into the presentation, I wanna give a little bit of background about George Washington University. Um, we are of course located in Washington DC in the nation's uh, capital. Um, and we were named after the first president of the United States, George Washington himself. 
Um, we were actually founded in 1821 by an act of Congress. We are one of just a handful of countries, I'm sorry, a handful of universities um, in the U.S. that were founded by such an act of Congress. Um, so we are now well into our third century. Um, and if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. Um, or seen a map of it, you'll be familiar with this image. Um, this shows you exactly just how much of an urban campus we are. Um, the School of Business is located right around in there. Um, this is the GW campus. And then, of course, you can see the National Mall, the Washington Monument, all of the um, Smithsonian museums, et cetera. So we're very much um, a Washington, D.C. school, you know, offering all of those opportunities. Um, and our School of Business was founded in 1928. Um, so we are going to be coming up on our uh, centennial in a few years. Hey, I want to share some um, rankings um, specifically for the GW School of Business for you to have a look at. Um, and there's one that we're especially proud of. Um, this just came out not too long ago, but we have been ranked number one by the Financial Times for the percentage of women enrolled in our global MBA program. Um, so if you are um, looking for a program that has you know, a lot of diversity, um, gender, ethnic diversity, you've come to the right place. Um, uh, so yeah, we are actually number one for percentage of enrolled of women enrolled in our global MBA and number two um, globally. Number one is in the US and number two is uh, globally. Um, so we're definitely an institution that, that values um, gender and diversity uh, in our programs. So um, I wanna go through what are the programs that we offer? Um, we do have two full-time MBA, prog um, MBA program formats. One is our global MBA, which is a full-time two-year degree. Um, and then we also have our accelerated MBA. The accelerated MBA is for students who have um, a bit more experience, like maybe you know over, over five years, closer to 10 years experience. Um, Sorry about that. It is open to international students. Um, both programs are, um, and both programs also have a STEM track that you can pursue. <clears throat> um, in addition to our full-time MBA programs, we off also have our suite of specialized master's degrees. Um, those are all listed there. Um, and I know students are often curious about um, what programs we have our STEM designated. So our STEM designated programs are project management, information systems technology, finance, applied finance, business analytics. And then um, in the Department of Accounting, there's actually two uh, master's de degree tracks. One is our general master of accountancy, which is not STEM designated. And then two is our master of accountancy in accounting analytics, which is STEM designated. Um, so if you're really interested in accounting analytics, you would want to make sure that you apply to um, the accounting analytics uh, master's degree. We also have um, our master of science in interdisciplinary business studies, which is composed of two graduate certificates. And if you choose two STEM designated graduate certificates, that can be a STEM degree um, or it can be non-STEM. So um, we are also proud to offer 18 different graduate certificates. Um, and you can actually, if you would do it, doing a master's degree that allows um, at least 12 elective credits, you could actually use those elective credits to take the four courses necessary to get a graduate certificate. Our graduate certificates are all um, 12 credit degrees, or I'm sorry, 12 credit certificates. Um, and so if, for example, our um, MS in management program um, offers at least 12 elective credits, so that's always a popular option for students in that program to use their elective credits to get a graduate certificate. And then you're graduating with a degree and a graduate certificate at no, um, no additional cost. All right, just some highlights um, about GWSB um, and things that differentiate us um, from other schools of business. 
Um, obviously, number one is our world-class faculty, as you've been able to experience today with uh, Dr. Zinkai's lecture. Um, we have faculty who are consistently um, uh, publish our in featured in major news outlets, um, producing really cutting edge research. Um, there's really, the sky's the limit when it comes to the, the talents and abilities of our faculty. And another advantage of our location here in downtown Washington, DC is we're also able to take advantage of uh, part-time faculty who are actually working full-time in their field during the day and then come to share their expertise with our students um, for their evening classes. Um, we also focus on having a very innovative curriculum. There's a strong perspective on international business um, and global business affairs in all of our programs. Um, we're, of course, in a very international city. Uh, we also have a high percentage of our students, our international students, um, from various countries around the globe. Um, so everything we do is very much globally focused. Um, there's also technology and analytics focus. Um, of course, if you're doing a degree like accounting analytics, that's a given. Um, but in many of our other degrees, such as marketing or tourism, hospitality, and event management, you're going to have a required course um, in analytics, in quantitative skills. Um, and then experiential learning. We actually have our very own global and experiential education office here in the School of Business. Um, and they offer a lot of opportunities for short-term study abroad or semester study abroad, if that's possible. Um, uh, as well as um, just experiential learning in the classroom as well. We have a dedicated career center, uh, the Fowler Career Center at GW School of Business. Um, they are here to support solely School of Business students, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. We also have um, various clubs that you can join, um, events, organizations. Um, we have a consulting club, a women in business club, um, we also have um, an office of entrepreneurship who, and they put on the Pitch George competition and the new venture competition where students who have an entrepreneurial idea can actually present that idea and then compete for, um, for seed funding. Um, and we have events to get students um, involved in the greater school of business community, like George Talks Business, uh, which happen about every month where our dean um, of the school of business actually interviews um, someone who's um, a notable person in, in business. Um, for example, we've had, uh, let's see, the CEO of JetBlue Airlines uh, last year. We've had the head of diversity at KPMG. So we really bring in some, some interesting and some big names to that. And we have a very extensive and involved alumni network um, due to the global nature of our school um, and the vast array of programs that we offer. We have alumni in pretty much every industry you can think of um, all around the world um, who are always wanting to uh, help out their fellow students and alums. Our programs are also very flexible and customizable. Um, so I did already mention about the graduate certificates and how you could use elective credits within your degree to earn one. Um, we also offer just a variety of electives within the School of Business that you can choose from. And most of our programs um, will allow you to bring up to six credits outside of GWSB. So if you, for example, started a master somewhere else, you can um, uh, transfer in up to six credits. We do also offer joint and dual degrees. So for example, if you want to do an MBA, um, but you know you are particularly interested in the hotel industry, um, you could do a dual MBA in uh, MS in tourism, hospitality, and event management. So we do have some of those dual degree options. Um, we also have joint degrees. Um, that would be an MBA JD, um, or we offer um, various joint degrees, which would be an MBA and then a master, one of the master of arts degrees at the Elliott School of International Affairs. So that option is there as well. And then I mentioned as well, um, our Global and Experiential Education Office uh, facilitates um, short-term uh, study away programs. Um, so most of them are overseas, um, but it's also possible to um, do one in the U.S. sometimes. Um, I know they had one looking at um, like the business of baseball um, out in Arizona. So I have some cool offerings there. 
Okay. So as I mentioned, we have our own career center here in the School of Business. Um, it serves solely School of Business students. Um, and uh, they have career counselors there who have a lot of experience in business um, and in their own right. And they are very keen to meet with our students early on in their academic career at GW. So um, you can schedule an appointment with them once you become a student. They can assist you with resume review, cover letter review, interviewing skills, et cetera. And their statement is sort of that they endeavor to open as many employers' doors on your behalf as possible. Um, so if you share with them that you're really interested in interning or working in this industry or with this particular company, um, they very well may already have an established relationship with that company. Um, or they can introduce, introduce you to alumni um, through their vast alumni database who would be able to um, uh, assist you with that, you know, do an informational interview, et cetera. So they really do a lot to assist our students with networking and um, having the most successful job search that they can. Right. And this is just an example of um, where some of our students go on to work. Um, an advantage to being in Washington, D.C. is that not only is it the head of the U.S. government with opportunities, um, of course, there, um, but we also have several international organizations that are located just blocks from GW. I'm sure you've heard of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, um, Inter-American Development Bank. All of the big four accounting firms have a large presence in DC, as well as major consulting companies such as Booz Allen Hamilton and uh, various financial firms. We're also seeing more and more private industry um, come into the area. Amazon has established a large headquarters in uh, Northern Virginia. And um, uh, Marriott Hotels are in Bethesda, Maryland. Hilton Hotels are in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Uh, Capital One credit cards are actually also in uh, Tyson's Corner, Virginia. So definitely a lot of a lot of opportunities and a lot of alumni to network with um, when you're a GW School of Business student. And as I'd mentioned, our alumni networks, um, no matter where you wind up after graduation, if you um, go back to your home country or to another country, um, there's definitely going to be an alumni network there that you can uh, connect with. All right, so I wanna go now into how to apply um, and what you need to apply. Um, so in general, to apply, you would just fill out our online application form and then you would upload copies of your transcripts, your resume, and your statement of purpose. State, statement of purpose is usually a page to a page and a half long. And that's an opportunity for you to share more with us about your background, um, personally, professionally, academically, um, you know, why GWSB, why this program? And then we'd like to know more about what you're thinking of doing in the future and how um, this degree may help you to get there. Um, and then you need uh, one letter of recommendation. So you would enter in the um, name and email address of your recommender. Um, and then you would be ready to submit your application. So again, online application form, upload your resume, your transcript, your statement of purpose, enter the name and email address of your recommender, and then you're ready to submit. Um, you do not need to pay the application fee because you are here at the SEED presentation today. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a code, uh, GoSEED0231. Um, at the end of the application, you just hit save and pay. Then you select that you have a code and then you enter that code. Um, our operations team will see the code and then they will get your application manually submitted without payment. So for international students, um, we have some additional requirements. Um, number one, of course, is English language test scores. If you have a degree from the US, uh, UK, um, Ireland, Anglophone Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you would not be required um, to take an English proficiency test, um, as well as for some other countries. Um, Indian applicants are required to submit a test score. We accept TOEFL, IELTS, um, Duolingo, and also PTE. 
And the scores that you see on the screen are our sort of optimal or preferred scores. If you have um, a 90 to 99 in TOEFL, um, a 6 or 6.5 in IELTS, or a 110, 115 in Duolingo, you can still be admitted, but you would likely need to take a three credit English course in your first semester at GWSB. If your transcript um, is not from an institution in the United States, uh, your application will need a transcript evaluation in order to be complete. The quickest way to fulfill this, um, especially right now if you're applying for fall, is to um, get a transcript evaluation done by any organization that's a member of the National Association of Credential Evaluation Services. So you may likely have heard of WES, ECE, Spantran, any of those is fine. Um, that's the quickest way to fulfill this requirement. It's also possible to just wait um, for our operations team to do an in-house evaluation of your transcript. Um, there's no cost associated with this, but it can take quite a while sometimes. Um, so we encourage people at this point, if you're applying for fall 2024, to, um, to have the outside evaluation done. But if you're not looking to apply until later, that is an option to just um, wait for an in-house transcript evaluation. And of course, your application can be submitted before we have the transcript evaluation and the English language test score. It would just be in a pending state until those things are received, and then it can move on to review. All right, very important, finances. So tuition right now um, is 1,965 per credit hour. Most of our master's programs are 30 to 33 credits um, in length. Um, so they are generally between 59 to $65,000 for most of the specialized masters. There are two which are longer. Um, applied finance is 36 credits and the MS in finance is 48 credits. So those ones are a little more. The global MBA is one uh, flat total rate of about 125,000 US dollars. Merit scholarships are definitely available. Um, and there's nothing special that you need to do to be considered for a merit scholarship. Um, you will automatically be considered. If you are admitted in your letter of admission, it will state how much scholarship funding you are getting. Um, and it's always given as a percentage. Uh, so let's say you get a 20% scholarship. That means that each semester that you are registered for, 20% of your tuition would be covered by the scholarship. I generally see students get anywhere from a 10% to 40% um, merit scholarship. Um, there are of course also international loan options that are available. Uh, we do have many students um, get loans with, uh, for example, Empower or Prodigy or 8B. Many students ask about assistantships. Um, and I want to clarify that um, there are assistantships that do become available, but it's not something that you would um, be given at the time of admission, like a merit scholarship. Um, at the start of each semester, any departments that have open assistantships would post them at the start of the semester, and then students would be welcome to apply for those positions. Um, we do not package assistantships as part of your scholarship. The only funding offered at admission um, is the merit scholarship. We do have um, on our graduate assistantship, fellow, assistantship and fellowship page, we do have a link to um, external fellowship opportunities, other outside fellowships um, that we recommend students look into. All right, and uh, hopefully that was an informative overview for you. Um, this is our general email address. If you have any questions, um, please reach out. I also wanted to share with everyone that um, this Saturday, March 23rd at 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern Standard Time, we are actually going to be having a virtual open house um, for GW School of Business. Um, we're going to have presentations from the Career Center, 
global and experiential education. You can hear from all of my colleagues. We'll have a specific presentation for those interested in MBA, those interested in specialized masters, lots of time to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to um, just stop the screen share right now and I am going to post um, a link to that in the chat where you can register for that awesome event on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. That was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure uh, if you could please share the link, a lot of our students would be certainly sure. interested in being a part of that. So uh, yes, I can see quite a few questions. I know we have slightly pushed the timeline and gone a bit over time, but uh, I would like to keep the two of you here for a little bit longer with uh, close to 220 students who are still in the audience. Uh, before I move to questions, I can see quite a few questions which have come uh, regarding the SEED scholarship. So uh, congratulations to those of you who have been shortlisted. We will, someone from the team will be getting in touch with you and letting you know about the next steps. For those of you who are still looking to apply, I am posting a link in the chat window, which has the link to the scholarship. You can click on the link and get to know more details about the exclusive scholarship that uh, GW Business has with Seed Global Education. I have also posted the application fee waiver code for those of you who want to apply. So all of that information is available for you. Uh, very quickly, Megan, if I can take my first question for you, uh, is uh, could you just provide us with some information about the application deadlines? Yes, of course. So our upcoming deadline is going to be April 15th. Mm -hmm. um, that is the deadline for fall 2024. Um, so if you are hoping to be considered for this fall, which is going to start on August 22nd, um, you want to submit your application by April the 15th. Great. So 15th of April is the next upcoming deadline. Um, on similar lines with that, uh, Someone wants to know, do you accept students on a rolling admission basis or do you have set deadlines? Um, so we do accept on a rolling basis. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, um, if you are an, an international student currently overseas, we would strongly, um, strongly encourage you to apply by April 15th. You would still be considered afterwards. Um, but just due to the amount of time that's needed for the I-20 and the visa process, um, if you don't apply by April 15th, you may run the risk of not having sufficient time for that with the visa wait times. Great, great. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. I'll take one quick question for Dr. Donald here. Uh, so Ashok wants to know, adding to, you know, earlier we were speaking about coding and data analytics, et cetera. So his question is adding to coding and data analytics. I myself have used uh, Python and tools like Tabular for normal data analytics. What methodologies, according to you, are more preferred in academia and the professional work environment? Uh, I'm, I'll go with the professional work environment first. And I, I'm only speaking for the United States. I don't have a global perspective on this. Mm -hmm. um, Tableau and Microsoft Power BI are the two tools that have emerged as kind of the most popular. Microsoft, because most companies have the Microsoft suite. So right. Power BI is just an extension of that. Um, most companies also like Tableau because Tableau is very easy to use. Uh, it, it, it integrates seamlessly with many software products that companies use. And it's designed 100% for data analytics. Right. Now, with that said, many different companies have many different tools. I just gave you what research has found to be the most commonly used in um, business. Right. With respect to academia, it's going to vary a lot. I mean, there's a lot with Python, a lot with R, a lot with um, SPSS. It depends on the application, depends on the type of research. Uh, things like Tableau and Power BI are also very used. It's a little wider, I would say, in academia than it is in mm -hmm. professional practice. Okay, great. I hope that answers your question, Ashok. Uh, Megan, coming back to you, we have two students uh, who want to know specifically about uh, the English proficiency tests and transcript evaluations mm -hmm. for international students. Uh, 
you know, mm -hmm. are those relevant to students from India, Nepal, etc., or would that be evaluated on a case-to-case -case basis? Um, so, yes, uh, the English proficiency test score is required um, for students who have degrees from India and from Nepal, um, mm -hmm. and a transcript evaluation would also be required. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question again, Megan, this is for you from Arzu. Arzu say, says, I am a STEM PhD candidate and have applied for OPT. Would I be able to attend school for a STEM MBA program on her OPT? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? So she has, she's currently a STEM PhD candidate. STEM PhD, okay. Yes, and she has applied for her OPT. But her question is, once she gets the OPT, can she go and pursue a MBA program as well? Would she be allowed to do that? Oh, sorry, Megan, I think we had lost you. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I froze for a moment, but I'm back. Yeah, no problem. Uh, did so you what I heard was she's a, um, what, what I heard was she's a STEM PhD candidate at a university correct. in the United States. That's correct. She has applied for her OPT okay. and she wants to know on okay. the basis of that OPT, can she be able to uh, pursue an MBA then? Um, so the question is, can she, after she does the OPT that she's um, guaranteed yes. with the PhD, could yeah. she then do an MBA, MBA. and yeah. then get OPT after the MBA? No, just do it with the OPT, like simultaneously. Um, the issue with that would be um, while you're on OPT, um, you are with you're going to be under the I-20 of the university right. that you're currently a doctoral student with. Mm -hmm. um, so you couldn't be on their I-20 and our I-20 at the same time. Um, so that unfortunately would not be possible. You, you would need to do your, your of uh, you know, apply for, for a GW right. program that would start yeah. right as your OPT is sending. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, for that. Arzu, sure. I hope that helps you. Uh, another question we have uh, from someone in the audience is uh, they, they've got, they're a CA and they want to know, is it possible for them to apply for the MBA program to GW? Oh, oh, they have a chartered accountancy? That's correct, um, yes. Uh, yes, you can apply. Um, you would, of course, need to provide um, a credential evaluation um, mm -hmm. that equates your CA to um, a U.S. bachelor's degree. One thing I do want to clarify that I had, had neglected to mention is that for our specialized masters, um, mm -hmm. work experience is not required. You can apply to any of those specialized master's programs you know, while you're a senior in your undergraduate study. That's fine. For the MBA, for the global MBA, they're usually looking for students who have a few years of work experience. Um, the global MBA is not something you could apply to straight from your undergraduate. Um, you would want to have a few years of work experience under your belt to be competitive for your application. Great, great. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm sure a lot of students had that question as well about the work experience. Uh, I know we've shot up quite a bit with the time, so I'm going to take my last question for this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Donald, this one's for you before I uh, wrap it up. This one's from Rishabh. Uh, Rishup is currently pursuing a BTEC in AI and data science and wanted to pursue a master's in AI, but wants to understand if he goes for, let's say, accounting and data analytics, number one, would that be a good career choice for him or would that be a complete switch to what he's currently doing and where do, does, do his opportunities sort of stand then? Yeah, yeah. Um... Normally, in the accounting profession, the accounting theory mm -hmm. can't be skipped, can't be skipped. Um, they've done studies. They tried at, at a, I believe it was Price Waterhouse. They tried to train people who were mm -hmm. data analytics to do tax work, and it failed. And they also tried to train people to do who were data analysts to do accounting and it failed. The reason why is it's hard to train somebody on four years of education by yeah. sending them to seminars. You know what I mean? Like it's difficult. I'm not yeah. saying it's impossible. 
I get students in my class, data analytics for accounting that are that haven't had too many accounting classes and they get through it, but it's a challenge because they're, we're solving problems that the given information is implicit. And so what could happen if somebody says, okay, I understand data analytics and they go to a meeting where they're solving an accounting problem, they don't understand the context of the question so it's hard for them to put tools together to solve. Doesn't mean it's impossible. I'm just saying that it's it's. I hope that answers the question. Um, you know, it's what normally happens at firms like that is they partner somebody like an accounting professional with a data analytics professional, and then they work yeah. on it together. Great. So thank you so much for taking out your time, Dr. Donald and Megan, and answering. Uh, all of the questions. I can see quite a few of you still have a few questions. I would sincerely request you to get in touch with the college itself. Megan had dropped an email ID. You can connect with them over that. I've also shared a few helpful links uh, in the chat window too. Uh, we still have close to 180 students in the uh, masterclass for today. Thank you so much for joining and you've been a wonderful audience. We will be sharing the recording and some important links of the session with you tomorrow. So thank you once again, and goodbye to all of you. Bye-bye. Good luck. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.